Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with the Bulletproof Executive. It's been over two years since this podcast first started, and just recently we published the hundredth episode with an amazing coffee expert named Dan Cox. If you haven't had a chance to download that on iTunes, please do. It's totally worth your time. This guy spent thirty years. He was the first employee of a five billion dollar coffee roaster. So check it out and leave a review while you're at it. I really appreciate your support. Today's cool fact of the day is most of us share nearly identical genetic material. If you compared two different individuals' genetic blueprints, only about 0.1% would be different. We humans also share about 7% of the same genetic structure as E. coli, 21% with worms, 90% with mice, and up to 98% with chimpanzees. And from a purely personal perspective, I am more than 4% Neanderthal. It shows right here in my forehead, see? I'm pretty excited about today's podcast. It is going to be a lot of fun because we have a human guinea pig on a human guinea pig who happens to have written four New York Times bestsellers, who's an editor at large at Esquire magazine, a commentator for NPR, which means he must have a sexy voice, and he's a columnist <laughs> <laughs> for Mental Floss magazine. And he's a New Yorker. Of course, I am talking about none other than AJ Jacobs. AJ, welcome to the show, man. Great to be here, Dave. Thank you. I think I share like 92% of my DNA with guinea pigs, So, but so do you. So do you. So everyone's a human guinea pig. That's a really good point. Uh, we all are guinea pigs, whether we like it or not. It's just a question of whether you pay attention to your experiments or they just happen to you. Exactly. Good point. Now, your three domains, and I love the way you do this, my, uh, my biohacker sort of blueprint ex explaining the definition has these domains on it. And you talk about body, mind, and spirit. Why are those the three domains for hacking that you look at? Well, I mean, I started this just because I love self-improvement. And I needed a lot of self-improvement. I still do. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm definitely a fixer-upper. Uh, and I thought, yeah, why not focus on, yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. The First, I started with the mind, so I spent like two years on that, then I spent two years on the spirit, and then two years on the body. So each of my books sort of was a, uh, was a deep dive into hacking one of those areas. I really like how you and uh, I, I guess other guys like Tim Ferriss has done the same thing. You find something you really want to do, and then you're like, I'm going to explore it, and I'm going to make a book out of it. And that's such a, a powerful way to tell your story, but by living it, instead of just sort of being like the anthropologist observing from a bubble and just getting immersed in it, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. And like you have that photo of you that we'll probably put in the show notes online if we're allowed, uh, of you with you know, this <laughs> giant like, I mean, you make ZZ Top look kind of like wusses with this beard. Uh, <laughs> compared to how you look now, you know, you're clean shaven and you look like, you know, a New York guy. Um, whatever that looks uh, you like. You got you got a little beer, not not a biblical one, but I see uh, yeah. your whole you you, not bad, very not bad. Yeah, I know that was. Uh, I definitely do commit to my projects, and I love them. I feel yeah. very lucky that I can make a living like that. You know, the beard was for a book about the Bible, and my wife hated it. She would not <laughs> kiss me for four months, and it was just a, a disaster. But it was a fascinating experience, uh, just trying to live by the rules of the Bible. All right, I have to ask. I mean, I've grown some not nearly as impressive as that beards, just because I end up getting frustrated or I have some PR thing I have to look halfway civilized for. Um, <laughs> did you shave your mustache, or did you let that grow too? Like, did you trim no, I let the whole thing oh. grow. I mean, it was crazy. It was like, you know, there's a lot. There, there are some advantages. It keeps your chin warm in the winter. It's like a sweater. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you do get mixed reactions. Some people, like, cross the street to avoid you because you look like a crazy person. And, and you do spend time at airport security. But you also get quite a bit of attention. It's like, you know, being pregnant. People come up and they want to, like, touch the beard. Oh, that's too funny. Uh, mine's been maybe an inch long, and I grow a really full kind of fluffy, manly beard, probably similar to you from your photo. And it, it's really funny because some women are like, oh, my God, you're so hot. And others are kind of like, oh, my God, you must be dirty. Yeah, it's it's very polarizing when having a beard does, isn't it? <laughs> it is extremely polarizing. It's like Hillary Clinton. 
<laughs> your beard was like Hillary Clinton. That's a great tweet yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> some love it, some hate it. Now, I'm sure your beard wasn't your greatest experiment so far. What do you think is your best experiment? Well, I loved uh, I love all of them. Uh, I mean, the the I'll just tell you the background on on the beard one was not all about the beard. Oh, yeah. It was because I um I wanted to work on my spirit. I grew up with no religion at all. As I say in the book, I'm Jewish, but I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So, <laughs> ouch. Uh, <laughs> no ouch for Olive Garden. <laughs> Uh, or Olive Garden. It's a wonderful restaurant. I got nothing against it. But uh, I, uh, I thought one way to explore the Bible and learn about my heritage would be to dive in and actually live it. So that's what I do with all my experiments. I, I try to live it. And so I wrote down every single rule I could find in the Bible, and I decided to follow them all from the famous ones, the Ten Commandments, and, uh, and love your neighbor, but also the less well-known ones don't shave the corners of your beard and as we discussed i didn't know where the corners were so i just let the whole thing grow and you know it says stone adulterers so i figured i should at least try to stone an adulterer i i use pebbles i use very small stones so that was how did you uh, target the adulterer to choose well this guy actually he approached me i was very much into the character uh so i had on my robe and my beard and sandals (laughs) i I was in central park (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> anyway. I try to commit. And uh, he came up to me and he said, why are you dressed like that? And I explained, I'm trying to live by the Bible from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And he goes, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And that's when I said, yeah, that would be great. Uh, thank you for the offer. And I took out a handful of stones that I had been carrying around for months waiting for this opportunity. And he actually grabbed them out of my hands and threw them at my face. So I thought, an eye for an eye. I could throw one back at him. So that is how I ended up stoning an adulterer. <laughs> <laughs> that is maybe the coolest story that's ever occurred on Bulletproof Executive Radio. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, Dave. I'm trying to think of how they did some hacking back in the Bible. They, they kind of did, though, actually. It did teach me about hacking my, my brain and my emotions, weirdly enough. Uh, I, I want to dig in more on that. And there's another, call it a biohack in the Bible, uh, I think it's in Levictus, if memory serves. And it's about, if you have black mold in your house, you should burn it, actually. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they knew something I'm back very then. very concerned about mold. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that mold in consciousness, it messes with me and you know, causes weird dreams. If you live in a moldy house, like you have nightmares a lot. It's just weird stuff that I don't think we have full explanations for yet. But, uh, okay. So when you lived by the rules in the Bible for one of your four books on, you know, pursuing all these different explorations... What what happened to your consciousness and, and your awareness and things like that when you started following these rules? Well, one of the big lessons I learned was just how much your behavior affects your thoughts, how much the exterior affects the interior. Uh, there's a great quote I love. I wish I had made it up, but it's by the guy who, invent, who created Habitat for Humanity. Oh. And he says, you know him? He, no, uh, just, just I, I know his, his work. Is, Dude, th- those guys are legit. Okay. Right. Uh, and he said... It's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. Brilliant. And I love that. And that's what I found doing this. You know, I would, I would force myself. The, the Bible says you can't lie or gossip or covet. And I'm a journalist and I live in New York City. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's my job. So I was like, how do I do this moral makeover? How do I become a better person? And that's what I decided to do is is pretend to be a better person. And the more I pretended, eventually I became a little bit of a better person. You know, I still lie and covet and gossip a a huge amount because I'm human, but I do it a lot less. And it's all because I just forced myself to do it. So, So that's a big lesson from the Bible and from cognitive behavioral therapy. They talk about this in a lot. Just even something as simple as forcing your face into the shape of a smile will make you in a better mood your your brain sort of catches up with the behavior is part of this because in order to do the experiment you had to actually think about what you were doing so you just became more aware because you're running a little filter that's like am i lying or coveting right now am i lying or coveting right now was that part of your process well that is true i mean it's fascinating to see how much you you are how much for instance you lie 
uh, without realizing it. I mean, it is a, once you start to pay attention to it, you're lying, you know, 50, 60 times a day. At least I was. Uh, and wow. same with gossip. You know, gossip, uh, it, it, you can't believe the portion of uh, the percentage of talk that is negative when you break it down. So, yes, being aware. This whole idea of metacognition, I love. I'm a huge fan of thinking about thinking. So anytime I can do that, and that's what this forced me to do. It made me think, what am I thinking about? Am I using these? You know, I only have 16 hours a day to think. Am I using these 16 hours wisely? I've done this electronic meditation thing called 40 Years of Zen, uh, where you spend seven days with a lie detector hooked up to your head, telling you when you're deceiving oh, yourself. Like it, it's, really, it, it's really intense and, and actually very difficult and sort of painful um but uh it, it drove me to have a little a little process running like am i lying to myself with what i'm doing right now and am i lying to the external mm. world and now my nervous system or something automatically flags it and like it's not normal to consciously choose to lie i mean there, there's times when, with my kids where i I might simplify a situation like, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to talk about what murder is today. So it's when a person right. is less kind to another. Okay, was that a lie or just, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know, a six-year-old doesn't need to know about killing like that. So otherwise, though, <laughs> That's true. I, I, I really strive, and I haven't thought of it from a biblical perspective, but I really strive to, to speak precisely so that my words mean what I say they did. And <clears throat> in the company, in, in, for the Bulletproof company, we're still tiny, uh, but... Like we have a no gossip rule. So if you're going to say something bad about someone, we actually call the person up so that you can say something bad about them and we can work it out rather right. than just talking behind their back. And we have uh, uh, this weasel word policy and I haven't even announced it to uh, employees yet, but uh, every time I use weasel language where I say, I'm going to try to do something, which means I'm not going to do it. I'm either going to do it or I'm going to choose not to do it, right? <laughs> Trying is, is wussing out. Uh, so right. every time I do that, they're going to get like credit to get more bulletproof stuff, uh, <laughs> you know, like more coffee and everything else. So I'm going to be it. personally accountable idea. just because what you just yeah. said there, you grew that skill just through trying to live it for two years. Ooh, I said trying there. That's you know. true. <laughs> but, well, you know, what you bring up was interesting. Uh, that brings up another experiment I did, and this one was not part of a book. This was uh, actually for Esquire magazine, mm -hmm. and it was uh, I experimented in something called radical honesty. Oh, and, cool! Uh, <laughs> yeah, this do? was and well, it was in the movement was started by this guy, a psychologist in Virginia, uh, named Brad Blanton, and he believes you should never lie, but he goes further than that. He says that whatever's on your brain should come out of your mouth. No filter. So I was like, that's interesting. So I tried that for a month. And that was the craziest, probably the, the most horrible month of my life. Did you get punched? Because I did not get punched. I thought I would. But I mean, well, I'll give you one example. Like my wife and I were out at a restaurant and we saw some friends of hers from college. And they were like, oh, we should all get together. And I had to say what was on my mind, which was, I said, you know, you seem like nice people, but I just really don't want to get together with you. I, I mean, I, I don't get to see my own friends, so I'd rather not see you again. And that was just so <laughs> awkward and horrible. My wife was furious, and with good reason. So I did learn that the no filter rule is probably not a great rule but i will say i learned one very valuable lesson from that and i do try to practice what i call sustainable radical honesty yes. because and i am much more honest than i used to be especially in positive things like for instance uh during this year, I would, I mean, during this month of radical honesty, I would think about my mentor uh, and that I hadn't spoken to him in months. And, you know, I, so I'd call him up and tell him how much he meant to me and how, how he really helped my life and career. And it was a little awkward because, you know, we're men and we're not supposed to be so yeah. expressing of our emotions. But I think he appreciated it. And I still know it certainly helped me. So this idea of really expressing the positive emotions on your mind. So really telling people how much you appreciate them. That has made my life better. So radical positive or radi sustainable radical honesty. Do you go out of your way to not say unkind things about other people now? Or I mean, like, like either in front of them or behind their back, sort of like that no gossip thing. Like, 
Well, I do try not to, yeah, yeah, behind their back, I don't try, I try not to, uh, although it's very tempting, but I do, in terms of, you know, there are ways to tell people the truth, but to couch it in terms that are much gentler than, I never want to see you again, so. Yeah, (laughs) that. Yeah, it, it it costs us something to say negative things about other people. Like I, I, I feel I, less energy. I, I'm just less happy if I'm bagging on someone, you know, mm-hmm. to their face or in in public. And I, you know, I'd rather like this is how I'm going to behave. Or this is what I'm going to do. Versus like you know, you're a poopy head, as my six year old would say. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now. Uh, Okay, this is already just so fascinating. But you've you've done like the Bible book, you've done Radical Honesty, which that wasn't a whole book, right? That was that was a chapter in in one of my books, was a but chapter, uh, originally right. an article in Esquire. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, what about the other two? Um, you outsourced your life, and I, I I really want to zoom in on this because I'm picking your brain. Next week at South by Southwest, uh, Manish Sethi, uh, the guy who created Pavlock, that cool wristband thing that helps you with habit forming. Um, He's hosting a panel on automating your life, and Tim Ferriss was slated to speak, and he got double booked. So at the last minute, they asked me to step in, and I don't know that I can fill his shoes. He's he knows more about automating his life than I do, but you might know as much as he does because you've done more of it than I have. So give me the down low on <laughs> on how to automate your life, so I can pick up all the tricks from you and I can share them with an audience. Oh, well, sure. Educate me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I know everything, but. Uh... Well, I did, you know, I've known Tim for many, many years. Uh, He actually uh, called me uh, after my first book came out and told me he was writing a book. Uh, And I had written a piece in Esquire about outsourcing my life, where I hired a team of people in Bangalore, India, to do everything for me. So they answered my phone, answered my email, they argued with my wife for me. Uh, (laughs) That was brilliant. Oh, it's great. It was the best month of my life. And I the just best article like, ever, read. by the way. I, the article, oh, I was rolling well, on the floor you, when Dave. I read it. So. <laughs> you are kind. Uh, so, yeah, I am a big fan of uh, automating. You know what I've discovered is an interesting twist is uh, automating your uh, your conscience. There are these apps, or I tested out Google Glass, and you can send yourself little messages. And what I like to send myself is, a message is like, uh, you know, is the, are you thinking, are you using your mind wisely? Because, you know, a lot of times I'll be in the line at the drugstore and I'll, I'll be like s- so angry at this woman because she doesn't know how to swipe her credit card. And, and then I'll get a little ding from myself, a little email saying, you know, what are you thinking about right now? And that sort of snaps me out. And I'm like, you know what? This is such a waste of my mental energy. I could use this time to do something productive. You know, you don't actually have to, you can use your downtime to think of interesting thoughts. So I do like that idea. It's sort of the outsourced conscience. And so you were wearing Google glasses and you had them set up to to ding and remind you to think positive thoughts, basically? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Uh, and I do, you don't need a Google glass. You do, you can do it with, uh, uh, you know, an iPhone. That's the, there, there are many apps or you can just program your email to send yourself messages throughout the day uh you know whatever you want to say you know uh, be kind to others give people the benefit of the doubt you know uh, you only live once you're gonna die i am a big fan of the whole uh, memento mori that uh reminding myself that i'm gonna die i find that very uh it's a little bit uh creepy but it's also very soothing because you realize it's true you know we really don't have mo- that long hair so you know stop it with obsessing about little things it it's funny to hear you tie those things together the the desire to think poor thoughts about the person you know the cashier going slow in front of you or something in in my view of the consciousness and of of the way our brains are wired like that comes from the meat operating system uh the the ego is another name for that but the part of you that's there to keep you alive and it's always worried about just one thing it's always worried about dying right at the end of the day Mm. like you know if that person is a bad person and when you really dig down through your thoughts like oh yeah somehow in there it was like well if they don't serve me fast enough i won't have enough food if i have enough food mommy won't love me and then i'll die it's some weird irrational (laughs) thing that's like it's not about you what you think of because you understand here but you're feeling it down here in your heart right and 
so like hacking that is is honestly the most important thing you can do better than eating you know a bulletproof diet or you know any of these other things i've ever found like if you could just do that you'll always like be better off and part of that is is just becoming comfortable with the fact that, yeah yeah you're gonna die sometime <laughs> it's true i mean uh, yeah uh and and i like what you say about if you if you look deep down it's it's I mean, the amount of cognitive biases we have is astounding. And the, you know, uh, I did an article on that uh, about how how we're programmed to think in a certain way because of our caveman roots, and how it doesn't apply to today. You know, we're we've got uh, I've heard it said we've got uh, caveman hardware and and uh, you know space age software. So it's really a, a mix there. So I, I like what you're saying about. When you really go deep, we're using our brains quite wrong. It's it it's a I think a lifelong task to continue to do that. And even if you talk to you know, the Buddhist monks, and in, in my understanding, the Buddhists were some of the first people to figure out this. Oh, it's a fear of death thing. Um, but even with all of that, it, they're still practicing a lifelong. The most you know exalted people there who who are the most enlightened still say, oh, I made a mistake there. I thought a bad thought, you know, and then, and then they do whatever they do about it. So it's that building a process that matters. And what mm, you've done that's, right. really, that's really unique here uh, is that you're saying, well, part of that process doesn't have to be an internal burden. It can be an external burden by having your iPhone remind you to think a positive yeah. thought. Like, how cool is that, really? Well, I'm a big fan of it. I mean, I'm a big fan of, uh, as you know, automating uh, because I don't trust willpower. I just think willpower is totally overrated and we don't have much of it. And what we do have, we spend in the morning. You know, it's a fixed quantity during the day. So yeah. by the end of the day, like if there's food lying, if there's, you know, unfortunately, I have jelly beans in my house right now. And I know <laughs> at about six o'clock, it's just going to go to hell. So I am a big fan of, of preparing uh, against, you know, uh, trying to battle my willpower by preparing for it and knowing I'm going to be weak. The Odysseus strategy, and you probably heard that phrase where, you know, they... Talk about they, that. Well, that's uh, in the Odyssey. Uh, the uh, Odysseus was, uh, knew that he was going to go with his boat and hear the sirens which were these beautiful mermaids, and they, they sing so beautifully that you jump into the water and die. So he knew that was going to happen, so he got, his, uh, he got his sailors to tie him to the mast so that he couldn't jump in. So he was preparing. He was doing sort of pre-willpower. He was like saying, I know this is going to happen, so I'm going to... And that's what I find incredibly helpful, the Odysseus strategy now. You don't have to lash yourself to your tr your chair but there are lots of steps you can take to sort of outsource your willpower and one of my favorites is just putting my iPhone in another room and and even on an, uh, on the top shelf uh, in a closet so you really have to climb up there and you and you kind of while you're doing that you're so embarrassed that you you're like I can't do this <laughs> and then you go back to work so yeah for me it's all and same with putting food on the top shelf, put the put the junk food away on the top shelf so it's not at eye level, so you're not tempted. Uh, there's the, the small plates idea. I love that because then you're not tempted to just fill it up with all this food. So there's lots of ways you can sort of tweak your environment to make yourself healthier. One of the things that interests me around that is the, the Pavlok device, uh, which is just coming out. Manish has done his, his Kickstarter for it. And this is a, a wristband, but it locks on software-wise. And you can say, I'm going to do this thing, and the wristband won't come off until you complete whatever amount of time and you do it, and it has GPS awareness. So if you say, I'm going to the gym for you know X number of, of minutes for X number of days, it's not coming off. And if you don't go to the gym, <laughs> it can actually, like, your friends can remotely shock you to remind you to go to the gym. Oh, oh wow, oh. that is funny. I never, I haven't heard of that. It, I mean, That's it's a whole it's, new level of accountability. It sounds over the top, but it's got like the social side of things where people are like, okay, uh, you know, I want support from my friends, but we're talking about willpower. So all of a sudden, now you're tackling like that meat operating system. You're harnessing that and saying, all right, 
you want to not feel pain, then you better do what my conscious brain wanted me to do in the first place. <laughs> so I'm, I'm intrigued at, at just the, the ways of hacking willpower there. Yeah, um, that's a great one. I hadn't heard of that. I, I did try one during one of my books where um, I was trying to eat more healthily. And I, I was addicted to these dried mangoes, which you think might be healthy, but they're really just packed with sugar. They're candy, so, basically. Yeah, they're candy. Grows on a tree. So I had, uh, there's this one hack that a guy in, uh, uh, it was a University of Chicago professor, Nobel Prize winner came up with, which is that, uh, is sort of the, the carrot, I mean the stick instead of the carrot, that if you break your pledge, then you will pay monetarily. You will lose money. And you'll have to, you sign a contract that you're going to give money to uh, a charity. But here's the twist to make it even more powerful. It's you give money to a charity you hate. Because <laughs> then, <laughs> right? Like, so I would pledge to, you know, I'm not going to eat any of these dried mangoes. And I told my wife, if I do, you give $100 to, uh, I believe it was the American Nazi party that I said. Ouch. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was, so every time I looked at a, a mango, I'm like, there is no way I'm going to eat that because I do not want to be funding the American Nazi party. And it was incredibly effective. And I've heard people use this strategy for uh, stopping smoking or any of these really hard habits to break. So you've harnessed the power of aversion to do that. But yes. going back to what we talked about earlier, living biblically and all that, when you're thinking those thoughts of aversion or you know something you hate, every time you do that, it's like thinking those negative thoughts about the cashier in line. So, you know, they, the old North American uh, story about you know grandpa, which wolf will will survive? You know, the mean one or the nice one? And the answer is well, whichever one you feed. So I, <laughs> I I'm. I'm questioning whether using aversion as a as a way to get things done is spiritually a good move for, for you just to like feel good about yourself in the morning. Like do you benefit more from fighting against something or working towards something? And I, Well, it's true. I do yeah. prefer the carrot to the stick if yeah. you got a choice. But sometimes if it's such a hard <laughs> habit to break, you break out yeah. the stick. Getting it done, getting the right thing done the right way is is so terribly important uh, like just but getting it done first and foremost so i right I, I get you there no i'm like you know as a parent you always try to do like you know reward them instead of like threaten them uh so uh i am all for that i'm with you on that but in this case nothing was working so i went for the extreme cool i want to go back to outsourcing yeah all right i still need to be schooled on this so i can drop some knowledge bombs at south by southwest so three most effective life automation, kind of outsourcing yourself, things that you came across. I actually read a very interesting article in the New York Times by these two economists who talked about it's actually a much better economic decision to outsource these tasks uh, because that, that frees up time for you to think more strategically and, you know, whether it's come up with an idea that's going to make you a lot more money. So it's not a waste of money to be spending uh, money to have people do the, the, the smaller tasks. And then the other part is, you know, I feel a little guilty about making other people do these boring tasks. So you have to wrestle with your conscience about that. Uh, and uh, I also wrestled with my conscience because... You know, the whole idea of outsourcing, you know, am I, by, if by hiring people in India, am I depriving people of jobs here in North America? And that was a big problem. But my favorite solution was a guy who wrote me and he said, you know what, I lost my job to outsourcing. So I hired an outsourcer to look for a new job for me. <laughs> and the outsourcer found me a new job. And I was like, that is brilliant. Maybe that's the solution. That is the coolest thing. It's almost like our economy. Like, like you can only create money by creating debt. It, it, so you can only create outsourcing by outsourcing to create outsourcing. We can create like a, a pyramid scheme of outsourcing where none of us have to do anything. I, I, I'm intrigued. Exactly. I like it. <laughs> hey, Jay, that's really funny. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm a supporter of, of that, by the way. I don't do most of my own shopping on Amazon. I ask my uh, amazing and wonderful executive assistant to do it also because amazon's going to tempt me with all this other crap i don't really need 
So then mm. I'm, I'm going to look at it and then I'll probably end up, oh, I, could, I should research that and I should click that and I might buy it, I might not, but I'm going to spend all that time. And if I'm like, this is the thing, please make it appear at the right place at the right time and pay for it with the right card. Right, exactly. Uh, all those, you talk about willpower, all that decision-making fatigue of, of all those little micro decisions, I don't have to, to do those. And I, I feel kind of like I'm a big baby because there's all these things I could do that I don't do. Like, could I outsource like someone putting food in my mouth? Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> but the psychology of it there is like, if, I, if I'm going to share the most information I can and, and do the most good with the Bulletproof Executive, I, I shouldn't be spending time on those things. So I make this kind of little bargain that's like, I, I better be doing my, my very best uh, to serve others. Uh, in the context of, of what I'm doing with this information. And in order to do that, it's okay to let people do things that I'm capable of doing that I, I sometimes even like doing, but just to like focus on being a dad and, you know, doing the the research and the writing and the things like that and you know, recording interviews with guys like you. So <laughs> it's like, it's so impactful. All right. I agree. Yeah. You got to get over that initial guilt and, and realize, you know, it's, you're, you're just trying to, to in the world you can and this actually will help you do do more good things what other outsourcing things worked really well for you uh let's see um well i don't know if this counts but uh it's sort of in the same ballpark but i'm very into the whole uh quantified self which i know you like as well the the keeping track of yeah. everything so i still am a big fan of uh, of my, you know, I'm still uh, on the Fitbit, yeah, and one of them works. I I just got stuck with a Fitbit because I've been on it for like years. But uh, you know that uh, going on the social sites and seeing how many uh, how many steps your friends take, and and they're comparing it to you, and they're making fun of you if you don't step, take enough walk, steps. That I think is good because that's outsourcing. You know, you're, that's a little bit of outsourcing because the peer pressure, you, you're using peer pressure for good. So I'm all for uh, these quantified steps. And, you know, another site that I recommend uh, is, have you been on any sites like CharityMiles.com or EarnedIt.com? I love them because this is, they link up to your Fitbit or Fuel Band or Jawbone, and they give you credit for your steps and a corporate donor will give money to a charity of your choice or so you take like 10,000 steps and then a corporation will guarantee that they'll give like 50 cents to help feed the hungry so then if you're sitting on your butt you feel like oh my god I'm such a bastard I'm uh, you know I, I could be out there earning money for for hungry people so that is some serious motivation that like plays on your guilt wow i i love that idea so if you noticed a change in audio quality that's because we just switched over to using a landline to get audio so you can get the best experience as you're commuting in traffic to hear what aj has to say because well i'm learning some cool stuff and well i'll tell you i mean that was quite a uh, technical snafu but we got through it and you know what we were talking about before is not getting annoyed at not using our our 16 hours of of thoughts to have these you know uh waste of time negative thoughts so so i when we first got cut off i was like oh my god <laughs> and then i was like you know what why am i getting so upset who cares we'll get through this it's not the worst you know it's it's quite a first world problem it is indeed, and we're not doing a live broadcast, which would have been a little more stressful. So if I had to call you tomorrow, you know, maybe in the middle of the video, it would look like we both changed clothes, and that would be that, right? <laughs> it, you know, there are worse things. Exactly. Uh, no, no wardrobe malfunctions allowed on this show, uh, except with certain <laughs> guests. <laughs> so we were still talking about automating your life. I want to know, what do you still automate after you went through your whole outsourcing experiment that led to that amazing article? Uh, what do you still, just aside from shopping, what else like is on the list? Well, I'm a big fan of, I do a lot of interviews for my work, so I definitely have other people transcribe them, even though it can be embarrassing because sometimes when you're interviewing someone, not you, 
you, uh, but when I interview people, sometimes I sound like an idiot. But you just have to get over that ego and uh, and let other people do it. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, just instead of come, I come up with like a list of of little things to, to research that I could do with a Google search, and it would take me you know five minutes. But those five minutes add up. So I sometimes have a list. You know, I, I'm doing a presentation, a TED Talk, and I want to know how do I get free photos that I don't have to, you know, free non-copyright photos. So I just added that to the list, and someone's going to look those up for me. And I do think it's worth paying, you know, $15 an hour to have that done. Yeah, it's enlightened laziness maybe is, is the way to talk about it. <laughs> I like that phrase. Uh, it, uh, that guilt thing. Efficient laziness. How's that? There you go. And, uh, one of the things that's motivated a lot of my career, people sometimes don't know this, but uh, I was one of the very early innovators around e-commerce and uh, cloud computing. Uh, the first company that the Google's first servers, Yahoo's first servers, Hotmail's first servers were like at, at a company where I was one of the early employees. And mm -hmm. I always... I always said that the best people who run computers are the laziest because they're going to write a little script to automate their entire job away. Then they just sit there and learn new stuff while the computer gets their paycheck for them. And <laughs> what I never realized was that you could do that with the rest of your life at the, the same way. Like anytime you can get something off your plate to let you do what's fun. And, and for me, it's like, you know, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a father, and I have the bulletproof executive and if it's not on that list you know and of course self-care is part of all that if it's on that list like really i suppose i have friends and all that but but all of those are, are valuable but the little things like, like get them get them out of there and, and it is lazy i guess that's true i'm lazy in a good way well you know when i did this uh, i tested out google glass for a couple of months for yeah. esquire and uh, and one of the things was mm -hmm. like just automating i don't know if you'd call it automating as much yeah. as sort of getting a um a guru or a concierge uh, or uh, a, almost like a caddy for life. Because, uh, for instance, I was I decided to try to, uh, I use the Google Glass to see, to do things I shouldn't be doing with it. Just, just for the article. I would not do this in real life. But I decided, what if we tried to cheat at poker? So I got my cousin, who is a professional poker player in Las Vegas, cool. and we synced up uh, my Google Glass so that he could see what I saw. So Whoa. he could see my cards and the expressions on the faces of other people. And in my little Google Glass video screen, I could see him. So I would be playing, and then he would hold up a little sign saying raise, or he would say fold, or you know he would say bluff here and bet $20. And it was just hilarious and a joy, and it actually worked. I gave <laughs> the money back to my friends at the end of the night because I didn't <laughs> want to be a total asshole. But it was, uh, it was fantastic to see that these things actually work. So, you know, that I think in the future there will be people that you can hire to be in your ear telling you to give you one other example of this you know i've been married for 13 years so i'm not going out to any single bars but i got this young guy who's like 25 good looking and he was i had him wear the google glass and i was at my computer so i could see what he saw and i could say all right go over to that woman you know here's what you should say and uh so can you imagine, like, you know, uh, if you're a single guy right. and, and you can wear this Google Glass without getting beaten up, which See, is a, a big caveat, you could have if you Neil, can put this on and have some really slick guy uh, telling you what to say to women, uh, that would be a hilarious, a fantastic little treat. By the way, I'm not saying that I was a very good Cyrano. I am totally, you know, I have no game because I've been married for 13 years. Yeah. So I did not help him at all. He did not see any action. But it was a, a fun experiment. Well, it sounds like, number one, we've got the world's best reality show planned. And, and number <laughs> number two, the idea that you could have Neil Strauss in your ear, you know, author of, of The Game uh, exactly. or someone like that. Uh, with, that's really funny. And In fact... It'd be really funny if, if the men and the women in a bar all had those on and you didn't know who was getting guidance. <laughs> exactly. Like I'm telling you, TV producers, I know we have a few who listen to the show. <laughs> there like, you go. Oh, Sign it up right now. I, I love that I, idea. I mean, I felt a little bad because there was you know, some deceit involved. But at the end of every conversation, 
he would say, you know, by the way, I've got this guy in my ear. And that actually produced more, far more interact. You know, the women were much more interested in that fact than in that he had these preset lines. That is hilarious. And speaking of Google Glass, if you're watching on video, this is what an unopened Google Glass looks like. Oh, look at you. Well, no, I, I have one, and it's been here for two months, and I haven't had the time to open it and configure it. Literally, like on my calendar, my EA has booked me to talk to someone or to do something every single waking minute uh, to the point that, that I really, I'm like dying to do this. I took it out, I tried them on once and said, these look cool, and I haven't plugged it into my computer. <laughs> uh, you got to outsource someone to do that for you. I'm thinking about it. Like I, I live kind of in the sticks, but uh, I would outsource the setup of my Google Glasses because even though I'm a tech geek from Silicon Valley, I don't have the time and the focus, uh, which maybe would stress me out, but it doesn't. It just makes me realize I need to find someone who can do my, my tech stuff <laughs> that I kind of like. So it, it's a funny a funny connection back to this. Well, we're... We're running towards the end of the show, and I feel like I only asked you half the cool things. I want to learn a little bit more about the quantified self stuff that you do because we share that a lot in common, and a lot of our listeners are into how do we track and measure the results of the biohacking we're doing. Uh, so what are the other big quantified self things? Do you do heart rate variability? Do you wear like the basis wristband? I, I was uh, one of the early executives at, at the company that makes those. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I do. I do the Wii blood pressure and... But to me, the one that really works is is the Fitbit, just the steps. Okay. Because I do believe, uh, and I talk about this book I wrote on health, is that the more uh, the more you quantify, the the healthier you will act, and that uh, and that we have really compartmentalized exercise and movement in our lives. So if we're if we're good then we go to the gym for an hour and then we sit on our butts for 15 hours you know that and that's just not good for us as you know i've heard you on other podcasts that you've done talking about how that just undoes all the good that the the gym does so this helps me to try to incorporate movement into every part of my day so the usual taking the stairs instead of the elevator i mean one of my favorites is I have kids about the same age as yours, and, you know, they're short. So when I talk to them, <laughs> I squat down uh, oh. to their eye level. And then I have a little conversation, and then I pop back up. So I'm doing like 60 squats a day just talking to my kids. So anyway, you can incorporate movement, and the quantified self helps with that a huge amount. AJ, you just taught me something really cool there. I, I'm going to start doing that, and since I'm taller than you probably, being 6'4", <laughs> I'll actually get more more burn i'm kidding yeah i'm a little i'm i'm sad they're gonna grow up to be teenagers and then it'll look weird if i start squatting while talking to them (laughs) be like what are you doing that's hilarious tell me a little bit about the global family festival this mega reunion you're putting together in june of 2015 Uh, this is an interesting idea uh what's the genesis of it i am so excited about this i i can't tell you this is I am my next book. I'm trying to build the largest family tree in history and that, to encompass all of humanity, all seven billion members of the family. And there are actually sites now that will help you do this. There's one called genie.com and another called Wicketry, and they have crowdsourced genealogy. So you merge your tree with someone else's. And by the end, I'm on something on Genie called the World Family Tree, which has 75 million people on it. So I'm cousins. I'm probably cousins with you on this. I'm cousins <laughs> with, you know, camp friends. I'm cousins. I've got 18 steps to Gwyneth Paltrow. Not that she's returning my calls, but, oh. uh, you know, this is, uh, and 22 steps to Albert Einstein. And everyone has this. We're all so interconnected. So I'm so excited. And I'm on this World Family Tree, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to hold the review? union where you get thousands of interesting people who are related and they can come and converge there'll be talks it'll be like a ted conference there'll be games uh lots of uh you know activities for the kids so it's going to be in june of 2015 and i encourage everyone to come and and if i could just tell people just email me or go to my website and tell me your grandparents names and i'll figure out how we're related so that you can uh, join us at this reunion. And uh, can I plug my uh, my email in there so that people know where to, to go? Oh, yeah. It's uh, a- 
aj at ajjacobs.com or or just go to my website, ajjacobs.com, and just tell me your grandparents, and we will take it from there. And it'll be, uh, it'll be, I'm, I'm just uh, so excited. No, I, no, weirdly, AJ. I think I'm more excited about this than any other project I've ever done. No, AJ, just uh, so you make sure you have your outsourcing arrangements in place. The first week, this show is likely to get between fifty and maybe seventy thousand listens, and another three to ten thousand a week after that, depending on lots of variables. Uh, so you might get a few emails. <laughs> <laughs> I want emails, please. Right. I want to be flooded. I yeah. want to be flooded, and you're all my cousins out there. And by the way, everyone, all fifty thousand of seventy thousand of you are invited. Uh, the people we can find a link to will get a bracelet and be part of the world's fa- biggest family photo. And uh, but everyone's invited. And Morgan Spurlock's making a documentary about it, so it's going to be. I'm really excited. So awesome. please flood me, flood me with emails. This is a worthy effort, and uh, your books are are awesome. For people who wanted to read more about your your books, the the mind book is called The Know-It-All, the spirit book is The Year of Living Biblically, and Body Was Drop Dead Healthy. Uh, So it was the fourth one, uh, My Life is an Experiment. Is that Exactly. uh, All right, so we'll put links to all of your books in the show notes, and people can, I'm sure, find them on your website, which is ajjacobs.com. And AJ, there is one question that everyone answers on the show. Yes. Top three recommendations for people who want to kick more ass. It doesn't have to be anything you've written about. Just what have you learned as a human being that other people should know about? All right. I'll do it really quickly. One, just the idea of gratitude and being thankful for every little thing. Uh, One of my books was about reading the encyclopedia. So I read about all of history and I realized the good old days were not good. They were terrible. They were (laughs) smelly. They were disease ridden. You died when you were 35. So, you know. We've got our huge challenges now, but at least we live now as opposed to in the 1800s. Uh, all right, so that would be one. My second would be, uh, like we talked about, quantify yourself. Try to keep track of, of the minimum, your steps, uh, because the more you are aware of what you're doing, the better you will act. You know, uh, And then I guess my third would be, uh, we also discussed it, uh, the whole idea of act your way into a new way of thinking. You know, if you don't, um, uh, if you don't feel like you're confident, just pretend you're confident. That's what I do when I'm writing my books. I just say, "What would a confident person do?" And I start making phone calls, and I call the publisher and say, "We got to have this massive party when the book comes out." And then, after a couple of hours, my mind catches up, and I start to become confident. So that is uh, that is my other secret is sort of the idea of a uh, deed before creed or fake it till you make it choose whatever rhyme you prefer wow great advice aj Excellent. i appreciate that advice speaking of gratitude so thank you for it and thank you for being oh, my on the show. pleasure thanks it, for having me on it, it's it's been an amazing pleasure i love the way you think and i love what you're doing and everyone check out this family reunion idea it's really cool it's simple to do just go to, send an email to aj at ajjacobs.com and help him out on what is going to be a really cool documentary well thank you so much dave and i'm going to figure out how we're related because i gotta have you there all right i hope i'm like your second cousin's girlfriend's best friend or something <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no All doubt. Right. Peace. All right. Thanks, Dave. I'm a bulletproof babe. And, and we totally I, didn't. You need that t-shirt. You need the bulletproof babe t-shirt. Oh, my God. I'm taking oh, a note on. I'm kidding. I'm taking yes. a note on that one. Um, Thank you. So, so pe- people <laughs> people really should know that like we don't sit ahead of time going, ooh, let's talk no, about talk each about other's products. Any, any. See the head of foam that's formed on it? This is similar to what you get with a latte.